It's March 27. Ukraine Media Center confirmed continues its operation. And now, together with Vox Ukraine, we're starting an open discussion entitled Combating Corruption in Ukraine, a Change in Attitude, Gamification and Cooperation. So to better explain what we should e expect for during the next two hours, let me invite to the floor Taras Luchuk, team leader of the EU Anti-Corruption Initiative, Integrity Cities component. Mr. Taras, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Taras Luchik. I work as the head of the component of one of the biggest EU programs in the area of anti-corruption efforts. And first of all, I would like to thank the team of Vox Ukraine for their inspiration and capacity to work with complex but interesting topics with whom the majority of other analytical centers don't work. For us, it's important to support such initiatives that don't only demonstrate quite a quick but short-term result, but rather to work with the teams which try to influence in the long term not only some specific elements of the society, but rather work as in case with the schools, with the adolescents, because we clearly understand that if we talk about prevention of corruption, it's not about new rules. It's not only about building new institutions. It's not only about the behavior of government officials or elite, but it's about our attitude to corruption, to faithfulness since young years, since school, since university. Because as they say, culture eats any strategies in the same way culture can eat any draft laws or institutions. If we're unable to build in schools and universities this idea of accountability, transparency, respectability, the idea that there should be zero tolerance to corruption later on, building institutions looking for and ensuring this, the presence of those people of that personnel who will adopt the decision on the institutional level will be quite difficult. Because if we talk about corruption, the corruption that's always about interaction between people, between specific people. So it's a matter of behavior. This is why I want to thank once again Vox Ukraine for their desire to pick up such important topics. Sometimes these topics are being ignored either in the society or in international technical aid, but they are still important because they allow right here and right now to think about uh, about the way we have to work with our generations to come that will be managing this country in 20 years, not only from the point of view of government and governance, but from the point of view of, of civil society, of businesses. And it's important here when this generation is grown, when they start understanding what is school, what is state, when they start understanding how the business, how the government works, it's important on this phase to understand, to realize how to work with this generation, how on this fundamental stage to set those weights and balances so that respectability and accountability, zero tolerance to corruption would not be something unique and exceptional, but so that they become the new standard for new generation, for the new society. Because otherwise we can continue running in circles, but without having the society itself create the demand and set the standard for zero, zero tolerance to corruption, the transparency, civil stance, 
and so on and so forth, that they are the new standard and any deviation from this standard would not be tolerated in the society. So without all this, building the accountable state and civil society will be very difficult. Us, as a program of international technical aid within the last three and a half year, years, we will be working in Ukraine and obviously we will be supporting all the initiatives aimed at work with the civil society, at work in the area of recovery, cooperation with the communities, work with the new generation that in 10 or 20 years is supposed to undertake the responsibility to govern this country. So once again, I want to thank the team of Vox Ukraine for undertaking those complex but interesting topics, for preparing the reports that force us to ponder not only over what's going on, but what's going to happen in future. And also I would like to thank for absence of any questions to the quality of those reports prepared by Box Ukraine. And now I would like to give the floor to the team of Box Ukraine for the presentation of their study. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to ask our technical team to get in a salahoop connected to us a member of Vox Ukraine who is about to present the results of the report prepared by Vox Ukraine on influence on information on perception of corruption by Ukrainians. Ms. Ilona, welcome to the Ukraine Media Center Ukraine Forum. Please share the key insights and conclusions drawn from this report. Thank you very much. My pleasure seeing everybody. I would like to thank Mr. Taras for the good words about us and about the importance to counter of countering corruption, changing the behavior of the new generation and other generations as well. So this report was prepared in cooperation with the representatives of Stockholm School of Economics. University of California in Berkeley, San Francisco. So what has become a motivation for the research? We've seen in many studies that they very frequently ask Ukrainians whether corruption is uh, corruption level is high in Ukraine, whether they consider corruption a problem in Ukraine, and obviously the majority of the respondents say yes. But how is this attitude and perception of corruption is being formulated? To what extent is it influenced by the corruption experience? So sometimes people may think that yes, corruption is bad, but at the same time they may give so-called tips to the doctor and think that it's all right. So how does it and the perception of corruption in, impacts the trust to the institutions? So what the survey of Ukrainians has demonstrated, survey that we've had in February this year. So in February this year, we've surveyed more than 7,000 Ukrainians The draw is quite representative, just like any other surveys held in Ukraine for the time being, because after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, unfortunately, the data about the population is closed, so it was an online panel. The respondents were filling the questionnaires in their mobile phones or just online. So basically, the main conclusions of this research are that perception of corruption is directly oppositely related to the activities of the government in overcoming corruption. So if corruption is high, the population thinks that government does not want to counter corruption or, does it or fails to counter corruption in a proper manner. A personal experience of corruption increases the perception of corruption in cer certain institutions. So if 
people were facing corruption in educational institutions, they are prone to have the high level of perception of, or perception of high level of corruption. Or th there is also so-called cross effect when the presence of corruption in one institution results in perception of corruption in other institutions. And consumption of news from online media such as Telegram and Facebook is associated with higher level of corruption perception. So it's worth em emphasizing once again, the people who have higher perception of corruption have less trust in the government and they want less to stay in Ukraine. As we can see on this diagram, the majority of people perceives corruption as a very important problem as they think that it's quite widespread. So basically we can see that more than a half of the respondents said that corruption, they responded about the level of spread of corruption assigning the marks 8, 9, and 10, which means very high level of spread. And looking at different agencies, we see that the perception of corruption is different. For example, President, National Bank, Educational Institution, or Centers for Administrative Services are perceived as less corrupt than other state agencies or institutions. Demographic factors do not influence perception of corruption in a major way, but still we've seen certain effects. For example, the youngest and the eldest respondents, they have lower level of corruption perception and the denizens of the cities, they have higher level of corruption perception comparing to the inhabitants of the villages and smaller towns. And in the West, the perception of corruption is higher than in the rest of the regions. We can see that the workers of the government sector, the state servants, and those who are government employees, like doctors or teachers, they have lower level of corruption perception than those working in private sector. And we see some branch solidarity here, or sector solidarity. So basically, the employees of the government sector a lower perception of corruption in the education rather than military in conscription offices. And in this graph we can see that the majority of people think that the law enforcement agencies are not quite efficient in countering corruption. We see one, two, three here is the low level of efficiency, but the evaluation or assessment of the efforts of Ukrainian government in their efforts to fight corruption is a little bit lower. So half of the people thinks that they do not will to fight corruption, but a half thinks that the government is willing to overcome the corruption. When we ask Ukrainians about special anti-corruption institutions, here the situation is a little bit more optimistic. For example, 23% believe that they will be able to reduce the level of corruptions at least twice. 11% trust that the institutions are capable of eradication, eradicating corruption at all. However, the awareness of the special anti-corruption bodies is not that high. As we see, only half of the respondents are aware of the existence of national anti-corruption agency. So basically, there is a lot of work in this field in terms of awareness about the achievements of anti-corruption agencies. And also our analysis identified that those who either know or have heard something about the National Agency for Corruption Prevention and have lower and other anti-corruption agencies are have 
lower level of corruption perception than those who know about National Anti-Corruption Agency. So probably those who have heard about punishment for corruption, they think that corruption has reduced compared to those who are aware of the investigations. And thus we may assume that knowledge about large number of investigations in relation of the corruptioners increases the level of corruption perception. In this graph, we've demonstrated our experience of corruption. So responses to the question whether within the last 12 months either you or your family members were asked to pay graft at certain state agencies or institutions. And thus we may see that those people who were interacting with relevant government authorities or agencies, their experience of corruption was from 30% for customs and courts to 13% for centers of administrative services. So certain government agencies are different from the others in terms of personal corruption experience when people are directly faced with those, that experience. And obviously what we've seen from our assessment is that those who have personal experience of corruption, they assess the level of corruption in this area as higher than average. Like if, everyone, if somebody was asked to pay graft in the hospital, they evaluate the level of corruption as high in the area of healthcare. And at the same time, those who were facing corruption in customs, they have the lower assessment of corruption in other agencies like police or tax administration. Right here on this graph are the sources of news. As we see, the majority of Ukrainians, they closely follow the news, watching them at least once a day. And the majority, the vast majority, gets the news either from social media or online media. And th those people have higher level of perception of corruption than those who mostly get their news from other sources such as radio, television, friends or family members. Also, we were asking the respondents about whether they justify resorting to corruption for certain reasons, for example, matter of life and death or other important issues like the ones that influence you for the career or not important issues such as avoidance of penalty for or like speed ticket. And we've seen the tolerance to corruption is not as high basically even in when it's a matter of life and death almost 40 percent said that you can never resort to corruption for to solve any problem. However, tolerance to corruption, we see that it was not related with the total percep or overall perception of corruption. Then, we were asking about the people's trust to different institutions and to assess this trust, we were asking them, would you donate or would you take part in a volunteer initiative if you were asked ab about it by president or minister, mayor or head of the community, famous volunteer or your friends? And as we see, volunteers, people who are personal acquaintance of the respondents and the servicemen have way higher level of trust than the authorities and we can observe the same picture in other surveys so this result is not unexpected but also we see that by the level of perception of corruption the readiness to take part in volunteer initiatives or donation reduces if 
People are being asked about that by the representatives of authorities. So in the vert vertical graph, you can see the share of the people who said yes, or most likely, for the previous question. And we see that in the case of military volunteers or friends, the level of corruption perception does not influence their readiness to take part in certain initiatives. However, in case of mayors or president, or ministers, so basically central and local governments, there is a clear reduction of a fraction of people who said yes. And to make it more illustrative, to make this conclusion more illustrative, in this graph there is a number of people on the vertical axis who said no, we're not taking part in that, and we see that this fraction is steadily growing as perception of corruption is growing with people. So basically there is no influence on such non-government se sector, let's call it like this, but when we talk about central and local authorities, the distrust grows drastically with the growth of perception of corruption. And also, we were asking about whether people relate their future to Ukraine. So good news is that 70, almost 72% said absolutely yes. And the rest of the people were giving other answers. So here are the answers that we were getting from people who specified their answer and we may say that there is quite a small fraction of people who want to leave the country and we were evaluating the influence of corruption on this component as well and we see that this probability is higher for those whose perception of corruption is lower and for those who think that the government effectively counters corruption or those who think that the corruption was reduced within the last two years. Also, the demographic factors, they have certain influence on this indicator. We've seen that the younger population from the south and east, the express absolute readiness to stay in Ukraine and the representatives of civil organizations, they have higher readiness. However, as you may see, the vast majority of the people say that, abs that they absolutely relate their future to Ukraine. Well, thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to any and all of your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ilona, for this illustrative research. We have time for one, two short questions, so if the journalists have any questions, please raise your hands, take the microphone, and Ms. Ilona will be answering your questions if we don't have any questions on the floor. So I'm having a small question. Ms. Ilona, do we have any information about the dynamics of corruption perception within the last couple of years? So we could compare it with previous years to understand whether these dynamics is positive or negative. How did it change within the last two years of the full-scale invasion? If we look through other studies, we can observe that the perception level remains at the same level. So it's like 40-50% keep stating that the level of corruption is still high and it's a huge problem. In our study, we've seen that the majority of the Respondent said that the corruption level has grown within the last two to three years, but it may be related to media consumption. The more uh, corruption is discussed in media, the more is its perception. But it does not necessarily mean that we should not discuss the topic, but rather to provide information not about the corruption, corruption cases, but also about punishment to, like... Supreme Anti-Corruption Court has made a ruling with regard to these or those people or that these or those corruption schemes stopped operating and now things are happening in the organizations in a different way and so on and so forth. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Solana. This is exactly what we're going to do. We'll continue discussing the matter of corruption. And let's take just a small pause, just a couple of minutes to prepare for the first panel as to the perception of corruption by Ukrainians and its spread over Ukraine. And we will be back on air in two minutes. Двиньте цей плакат «Вокс Україна» ближче до стільців. Олежа, ще двигай ближче до стільців. Да, ось так. Один, два, три, один, два, три, один, два, один, два, супер. So let's continue our work and we start the first panel of our discussion. Let's talk about perception of corruption by Ukrainians and and let me introduce our speakers today. It's Taras Lushik, is the team leader of the EU Anti-Corruption Initiative Integrity Cities component. Svetlana Slipchenko, Deputy Executive Director of Vox Ukraine NGO, Head of Vox Czech. Joining us online will be Serhi Yatsik, local consultant for the EU Anti-Corruption Initiative and advisor at Zhitomer City Administration for Publicity, Accountability and Prevention of Corruption. And also joining us in our studio is Anastasia Mazaruk, head of the Monitoring and Evaluation Department of Transparency International. So, Mr. Taras, we've heard and we've seen very interesting and illustrative presentation as to the perception of corruption by Ukrainians and how does the information influences this perception? So, is everything really so bad with corruption in Ukraine as our citizens think? Or maybe there is a gap between perception and spread of corruption in Ukraine? So, the microphone's working, right? Look, as you said, the key word here is the perception. Perception, the, the word perception means that it's different from the reality, that the reality is different, and it's not about corruption. It We may say this in every sphere. So our perception and the reality will always be different. It's an axiom. So it's clear that if we ask whoever whether we have corruption in Ukraine or in the in communities, obviously they are there. No one can say that it's not there. But it's a philosophical question to which extent those corruption manifestations influence our life, our everyday life. So it's important that when we communicate about corruption or about or about accountability, 
or about any changes in prevention of corruption, it's important to understand the consequences because in Ukraine, just like in other countries, the media are focused on getting more users who open this or that piece of news. And in this case, it's important to have this ethics and understanding of consequences. So basically, we cannot reduce the significance of reality, but we have to still understand the consequences. So how does it influence not only the number of TV spectators watching a TV channel or users, internet users visiting some portal, but how does it influence the perception of the state from the outside? And also important that when we talk about the reality and perception of corruption, it's about the basis of comparison. It's about point of reference. This is what's important. My feeling so it's a feeling, it's subjective again, right? Because my perception is different from reality as well. And my perception is such that Ukraine within the last 10 years has made an incredible leap in terms of change, changes, in terms of steps that minimize the corruption risks in a lot of sectors. And those reforms that happened in a number of sectors like local governments, or in culture, they changed a lot. Like, I remember like 10 years ago, when to get to, to get for a session of local council, that was some incredible story, like, you know, to, to get access to some ruins, like adopted by local council, that was something incredible, but now it's a standard, not only from the point of view of legislation, but also from the point of view of our per perception. Sometimes we're, well, previously we remember that getting a resolution by cabinet of ministers, it was a miracle, now it's a standard thing. Not many people remember that, like government services, like, were provided in a very difficult manner and now you just come to a place looking like a regular business where you get a government service. So it's important to have this point of reference. We don't have to compare ourselves to other countries which we do very frequently, which activists, analysts, politicians, opposition, media do, but we have to compare ourselves to, wo to what was before. Because the, the changes that happen, they are cardinal. We may not feel them, but we have to just recall or ask somebody, like, remember the way we were getting the police clearance certificate. Now you can do it in a digital way without leaving your home. Previously, you had to spend a lot of time to get this simple certificate, or now we talk about the activities of classic anti-corruption infrastructure. So let's recall, was it possible like a couple of years ago when the indictment was served to a people's deputy of Ukraine or a deputy minister or say deputy of a local council? That was a unique and uh, miraculous story like 10 years ago. No one would even believe that. People would think it's a fake. Well, we will not notice it now, but the, those news, they keep popping up, which means that anti-corruption system works. So my key statements, yes, reality is different from perception and we have to understand it and we have to emphasize it. Another statement that we, it's important to have the point of reference. We don't have to compare ourselves to the partner countries, to the neighbors, but also to compare ourselves to what we were before. But to do such comparison, we have to stop for a minute and think about the way we were getting these services before, like seven, five, ten years ago. And would we have such news in the anti-corruption sector like ten years ago? For example, a media writes that the head of the state agency or vice prime minister in cooperation with anti-corruption bodies prevented, say, as, as it really popped up in the news that prevented some graft, people would have thought it's a fake or something like that, but now it's a reality. And another third important statement is that we have to think very 
good about the consequences of the communications that are going outside so it's very clever and proper yeah we have this classical corruption perception index and again it's important again to communicate that it's not a fact it's perception of corruption so the way corruption is being perceived in the society whether it exists or not so those three statements they are very important for our understanding that for all of us it's important to understand the reality yes but on the other hand we have to understand that any external communications they have their influence too they have their impact and we keep forgetting about it in the chase of some beautiful headlines and again another important detail you have to be aware of things which happens frequently in media that when we write some big and beautiful headline and then you dig deeper into detail someone says like it's corruption and they start digging deeper and things turned out to be quite the opposite way i don't want to quote it but one of the city mayors with good reputation in ukraine he says like look he had a situation which is very illustrative when one media in their headline they accused one of the utility enterprises of corruption in fact of corruption and when they started sorting things out like there is a headline everybody reposted it even some international partners paid attention to it because every, everything is translated but when they started digging turned out that the journalists who were preparing the news they turned out to be just unprofessional but there is another story behind this like there is a question after this headline can there be potential harm to this city in terms of reputation it, it not only maybe it happened and can this harm be mitigated then because no one would write about Lakia or all right that was our mistake the things are quite the opposite and the ministry of infrastructure did everything fine they did a great job yeah e even if it's written no no one would be interested to read it like like for a regular average ukrainian right yeah well somewhere you know in between some, some in between other head headlines there is a mention of someone's mistake like three months ago so e it's not a conclusion right it's an accusation and we have to weigh them very well to argument them because we keep forgetting about this side that behind the headline there may be the absence or at least lack of professionalism i'm not saying those problems do not exist they yes they do exist they are numerous we have to mitigate them to minimize them but still we have to have ethics of communication and if there is a material issued about any, any corruption risks or any potential corruption i think that the management of institutions that prepare those materials they have to be to to analyze to double check the material twice as better because then it gets in the results of this survey where people read it and they lose trust in the authorities however in that case that might be not as justified unfortunately denise Bigus was not able to join us today it would be good to have to have him here in our studio during this conversation but i would like to ask you about a couple of things like yeah we read those telegrams strips we read the news from ukraine ukraine's Pravda or other ukrainian sources and then the news the news about fighting corruption they are always us of positive nature like nabu or sub they caught a corruptioner and then there is investigation but what are the conclusions that people draw from this that corruption exists and the question that could be asked from mr denise but i will retain it open for our speakers how to on the level of news how can we talk about the fact that we've punished the corruption or we've prevented corruption but people how to make people perceive it not as another fact of corruption in the top level but as a description of our way of prevention corruption
of countering corruption. Thank you very much for the question. I would like to reflect what Mr. Taras has just said. And let me start from the end. First of all, about why such negative news draw so much attention from the people uh, uh, about some corruption activities in some enter enterprise, in some government company. It's like people have this uh, evolutionary mechanism, a confirmation bias. It helps us to survive because people paid more attention to the threats and they were able to survive. So this mechanism is still with us and now it reflects in the way that we read the news. We pay more attention to everything negative, everything that is of threat, of danger, and we remember those facts better. And even if any debunking or explanation then emerges, we would ignore it because we've already reacted to the negative news and we've potentially, maybe subconsciously, we've, we're perceiving it as a threat. Another thing that I would like to reflect e upon is one of the slides that, that was demonstrated by Ms. Ilona that the major fraction of the news about corruption was received by Ukrainians from Facebook and Telegram. This is quite logical because if we complement it with other statistics, if we see the media consumption habits of Ukrainians, media program Internews has such surveys in Ukraine, we will see that first social networks are the top source of news for the Ukrainians. It seems like 76% of the news are sourced to Ukrainians from social media. And the leaders are Facebook and Telegram. And share of Telegram has grown within the last couple of years comparing to Facebook. So it's logical that Ukrainians get news about corruption from those sources. However, let's think about other things on the social media. There is Russian misinformation, right? There is Russian psyops, the robots, the sock puppets, and other mechanisms of Russian influence in Ukraine. We have the news that can be interpreted by Ukrainians in different ways. Someone construes it as countering corruption and someone otherwise says that it's a lot of corruption in Ukraine. We keep fighting it on and on and we still cannot fight it. We still cannot overcome it. There's on top of it Russian influence aimed at inciting conflicts inside Ukraine. Between Ukrainians, we see the Russian fakes provoking rage and wrath in Ukrainians, sowing the seeds of destructive mechanisms in Ukraine. And to expand our picture of this gap between the actual corruption and its perception. In fact, there is yet another survey by Vox Ukraine that was published in June 2023 in our website. It was about the perception of corruption among the students, but it covered the general framework of what's going on with the corruption perception in Ukraine. Our analysts analyzed more than 80 surveys of Ukrainian population and companies since the end of 90s, and there is a stable trend there. 70-80% of the respondents think that Ukraine is either very corrupted or corruption is a very important problem. And only 10-15% to of the respondents were saying yes to the questions like have you or your relatives were facing corruption within the last 12 months? So. There is a huge gap that exists for the years and it exists not, not only in Ukraine, which is basically covered by our another research that Ilona was telling about. So what's the irony about it? Yes, the pro problem does exist. The problem of perception of the same news. But on the other hand, if there is some ban or limit restriction of the news about anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine, we will roll back to the level of totalitarian countries, like what's going on with corruption in the country or whether there are any corruption schemes, like no, they do not exist and people have a fall, false impression that there is no corruption in Ukraine, like if it's not covered in the news, it does not exist. The same thing happens in Russia, like 
the citizens of Russia, they think that they are, their officials are quite respectable and reputed. There is no corruption in Russia. So if we want to avoid this bias, we have to tell that, yes, there are facts of corruption that were documented. There is the preventive work underway. We need such news because otherwise we will roll back into to, to, to the level of totalitarian countries. You were mentioning the fakes that were spread by Russia. Well, most probably Russia, because I don't know who else would be spreading fakes about Ukraine. So how frequently do you f stumble upon such fakes online? And how does Russia use those fakes against Ukraine in terms of, say, Western support, Western aid to destabilize it? Well, we were trying to find some percentage with our team of such news, but we understand that our surveys are limited because we cannot cover all of the sources where Russia inserts their fakes. What I can tell you for sure is about dynamics. Just like in European information space, in Ukrainian information space, the growth of number of fakes with regard to corruption in Ukraine and different forms of discrediting of Ukrainian authorities, specifically from the point of view of existence of some corruption schemes started popping up in mass back in November, December 2022. Then within 23 and 24, they stay at the same level. So this narrative on discreditation of Ukrainian authorities, specifically about the corruption in Ukraine, becomes stable in Russia, in Russian propaganda. It can be considered a strategic narrative. It has a long-term goal to restrict the aid for Ukraine that we receive from our Western partners, both military, humanitarian, financial, maybe even the aid to our refugees. To do this, Russia inserts a lot of facts in a number of ways. For example, through online media, if we talk about European countries, and also through the network of their pseudo-experts, those who pose as experts, as, uh, as some decorated experts, but in fact they repeat Russian narratives in English or other foreign language for their target audience. They, they are the most active in Twitter or X, as it's called now. They also have their YouTube channel, sometimes they have their own media or some co-ed columns. Uh, we were debunking one of the cases with Vox Check. There was an article published in the media called Global Euro News, as if published by Seymour Hirsch, an American journalist, who was claiming that William Burns, the director of CIA, was coming to Kiev to, pr to inform about extra high level of corruption in Ukraine and also discontent of the president's team about the president's high share. But there are no evidences provided in the in the article. And on top of that, Global Euro News is just a fake Russian site that mimics European news sites. And Simon Hirsch, the author of this article, is a pseudo-expert who works for Western audience and systemically repeats the Kremlin narratives. Talking about Ukrainian information space, you, there's a lot of Russian misinformation aimed at the representatives of the top level government officials, military. There was a case circulating online in March, yet another attempt of discrediting both Zaluzhny and Zelensky. There was a video spread as if the video was created by BBC, and it was saying that Valeria Zaluzhny got $53 million to refuse his political ambitions. And the propagandist was adding as if Christo Grozev, an investigator of Bellingcat, studied the details of this agreement and that it really existed, but it was a fabricated video from elements from different interviews from BBC. So in fact, BBC did not publish any such video. It was an edit and Christo Grozev also debunked this fake on his behalf. So here we see that Russia tries to use some reputed sources such as Bellingcat or BBC to, to add more weight to their fakes, but they do it 
with such low quality and their fakes are generally of low quality and they are being debunked right away and yet another fake that I want to give the example about not to take a lot of your time so it's one of the latest ones another attempt to put a stain on Ukrainian media is Islander that's the name of the media that was saying that Zelensky through his trusted persons acquired two yachts worth of 75 million dollars as an evidence there were doc the scans of the documents and the pictures of the yachts were presented in the media so a lot of information was covered with black market uh, marker and as soon as we started studying them we, it turned out to be just a regular photoshop and the companies that own the yachts they also debunked this fake and they've mentioned that the yachts are still being sold and no one has bought them so far so such fakes they emerge on systemic basis both in ukrainian and european information space we are being rocked from outside to create negative emotions in us aimed against the government against the military officials and for the foreign audience those are the attempts to undermine our international aid thank you very much countering corruption is the demand from the society and it's a demand of our western partners of the eu to keep supporting ukraine so miss anastasia in your opinion and in the opinion of transparency international what are the most efficient mechanisms of overcoming corruption which were all already engaged by ukraine and which still can be used by ukraine thank you very much for your question the words of previous speakers resonate with me a lot thank you very much for your study it's real fundamental and it demonstrates the trends that we keep observing for a long time in in according to the corruption perception index of transparency international that's a study published for a number of years according to the results of year 23 it confirms those sentiments that taras was mentioning about we this year we got plus three points and we got 36 out of 100 points and we ended up among 17 countries of the world that demonstrated the record result for them and now we're in a position of a, we're in a peak position of our state and in a 10 years perspective we've made a real huge leap so how are those results achieved and how we can use the tools to overcome the corruption what are the additional tools that we can engage so let me put my response in three sectors so what influences the perception of corruption in the state so through the prism of prevention and punishment to prevent corruption a country has already created a lot of tools that allow allow it to easily avoid corruption practices for example centers for administrative services the instruments to obtain services and certificates online queues online trans online feeds of the court sessions parliament sessions any public services in the same way there are digital systems created such as prozoro and prozoro cells that allow to have access to the government services real time <laughs> something that never happened before and the country created a lot of efficient services efficient tools that allow the citizens to see this influence already as to the culture is important to have this engagement to create the culture of zero, zero tolerance to corruption and in this case the existence of media investigations media cases talks about corruption in public space they really add to the public discourse the understanding of the essence of corruption how can every single city citizen influence it how can it be investigated how this or those things happen so basically if we talk about the 
consequences of media investigations, the population of Ukraine receives their subjectivity. We see then the citizens of the community, they understand that their taxes are their taxes and they want to influence the way the, those taxes are spent. Like this, in this year, it was demonstrated that, okay, we don't want to buy vegetable cutters into the, for, for the schools. We want to hand over those funds to the military. The citizens have more, more intense understanding that those are some ethereal funds they have no access to. It's their funds, it's their money, and they start realizing their potential in terms of influence on the way those funds will be distributed. And there are more and more journalist investigations that demonstrate how the corruption or how a corruption or fate may be influenced or some situation may be influenced so people can pledge some support. And now there is more culture formulated that being a corruptioner is not cool. It's, it's a shame. So the, there is a narrative being formulated that if you are a government official, and you get public funds, you cannot like afford a wedding where you invite 400 guests and you cannot justify the source of those funds. That's not okay. And the society has already this understanding that they can ask those questions from their governments. And if we talk about punishment, that's a third aspect when we see how the anti-corruption infrastructure operates. For example, Supreme Anti-Corruption Court will issued 175 rulings with regard to top-level government officials. So the people who have high level of graft and uh, who, whose cases are of great complexity, for example, one of the latest cases was a draft in amount, in amount of $80,000 and the person was sen sentenced to eight years behind the bars with confiscation of all the property. Did we have any cases like that before? Before anti-corruption infrastructure agencies were created? I don't remember any such cases. And it's clear that this topic is not so intensely discussed by the society. Society doesn't know a lot about cases like that. But when we speak about existence of such investigations, about such moves, it's incredibly useful to reflect upon them and to underline the importance of these shifts. How else can we be reinforced. It's important to increase this subjectivity and understanding of the fact that, yes, I can influence different stages, different spheres of my life and formulating of this culture of interaction when I choose, when I choose to obtain driver's license in a legal way to pass the exam multiple times but not choose the easier way when I do not agree, I do not accept any proposal and I'm looking for tools not only to refuse such a proposal or suggestion but to punish or to give publicity to that story. And we see that the more intense is this public dis discourse, the better it helps to exercise this control function. I agree with Taras on terms of this canceling culture that is growing in the society. Well, it does have some aggressive aspects, but in case of professional and high-quality approach to the work with cases like that, they will have positive long-term consequences in terms of overcoming corruption. Thank you, Ms. Anastasia. I'm asking our technical team to get Mr. Sergei join us online. And on this phase, I would like to discuss the necessity or absence of such 
necessity to differentiate corruption by levels, Mr. Serhi. We're not seeing you so far, but we're hearing you. Can you hear us? So our technical team is bringing back the video. We're seeing you. Not permanently though. So, Mr. Sergei, the corruption in the top level and like a regular corruption in schools or medical institutions, should we discern those levels of corruption? Is it same dangerous? Is it, I mean, the corruption with the local governments and on the level of central government, is it same dangerous? Well, your question is complicated, but I will tr try to answer it. Well, talking about top corruption, you know its harm is easier to mention in terms of calculation and scale, but the everyday corruption cannot be neglected either. Here, we have to look at this situation in a following way. For example, corruption in schools or medical institutions, like everyday corruption, something that we call everyday corruption, it's it's of harm of this, to the society too, because I am a father of three kids and I can say that our children may not be educated, but all those models of communication and interaction, this is what they copy, they absorb it as a sponge. They see this interaction between father and mother, close relatives, the way they interact, well, I, I, I'm not even talking about the government officials, or local governments. So, so how do they interact in terms of everyday corruption? If we have this zero tolerance culture and children see it, I think that from the point of view of right here, right now, of technical solutions, we need to talk about countering corruption on higher levels. This is why we have those special anti-corruption agencies which are supported by the society. But when we talk about everyday corruption, we still have to remember that the consequences, the negative consequences are about to come not today, but tomorrow or the day after, and it will influence the further development of the country. Our discussion is a bridge. Me, as a speaker, I have to build a bridge to the next moderated discussion on interaction with the youth. And I want to extend my appreciation to the team of Vox Ukraine, who are working in the places of respectability, holding youth marathons, we've seen very intense response from the from the youth who have a desire to work, to interact, and they perceive all the manifestations of corruption in a very sensitive manner. You know this youth maximalism that is in their veins; it should be forwarded into the or properly canalized, so to say, and supported. You know, we keep saying corruption all the time, but we want to say more about respectability, reputability. So anti-corruption is this respectability. When we talk to the youth, to the young activists, to the students, even with the school students, we use the word respectability, trying to emphasize the positive effect of countering corruption. Of course, there's still a lot of matters such as education of the whistleblowers institute or raising a whistle whistleblower institute when the majority you, you know that the, they have the traditional attitude to it which is not quite positive and here we have to work a lot not only in the negative key but also in the positive to emphasize the respectability reputability to show that we have zero tolerance to corruption well, we don't tolerate it on top levels and we don't support it on the everyday level. So yes, there is certain differentiation, but the conclusion from your question is such that we don't have to s differentiate these two notions a lot because one uh, a long road starts with one small step, so we have to Pay attention to everyday corruption too. Let's not forget that respectability starts from something small. 
So, well, this is my answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Sergey, for those inspiring words. Well, here I would like to invite our journalists to join our conversation. If you have any questions to our speakers, please ask them and we can work in the dialogue mode. Can you please tell us the logic of over corruption overcoming process? It has three stages. First, when we discover corruption, then when there is inevitable punishment, and then we remove the causes and effects. Doesn't it seem to you that no, the trend is more about talking so that then people get disappointed about ability of Ukraine to overcome corruption generally. Thank you. Well, who is ready to give an answer? Well, in my personal opinion, no, it's not so. I don't think so. Because the discussion and uh, dialogue, healthy dialogue over some problematic issues and on top of that, all those problematic issues that are arising, they are being discussed with certain solutions, suggestions of solutions. Well, let me give you an example. For example, the X worth 17 hryvnia, and after that, there is an agency, logistic operator, who changed the rules of the game, and they changed their approaches to procure food for the armed forces. Do we have more problematic issues? Yes, of course. But is it safe to say that only to bring everything to negative and pessimism, this is the only purpose that it exists? No, I cannot accept this opinion. Mr. Truss, do you have anything to add? Well, discussion cannot be the goal itself. There should be solutions, there should be some steps, some measures that were taken as a result of a discussion, whether we're talking about some specific case or when we uh, work on development of the policies in terms of countering corruption. And it's important that those can be both parallel processes, discussion, search for solutions, and their implementation. Another important detail that we keep forgetting about that implementing a decision or like adopting Adopting a decision is one, just one step. Implementation of this decision is another thing. So if we create anti-corruption bureau, it's important to have it operating. Whether we change any part of the process or we launch a reform like in the court system or something like that. But again, what Anastasia has just said, it's important to have this discussion happening, but it should entail certain consequences, certain actions because if if the discussion has no result that's a disappointment because if people invest their time like or when we talk not about the case when we like develop some solutions like the, there are meetings there are negotiations like people invest time and efforts in it and if it fails people are disappointed so we have to understand that there are no simple solutions to the complex problems. Minimization of corruption risks, overcoming corruption, is not a simple task. There are no ready-made recipes, something that can be copied. They just do not exist. We can always view other examples, and but it's important to discuss whether such example is realistic in terms of its implementation in Ukraine. We have our own context on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have to understand that, again, measuring, measuring ourselves comparing to our neighbors who we look upon, we understand that the level of corruption is lower there. Or, like recently there were news about one of our neighbors that there was a recording about effects of corruption in one of the European countries. So we have to understand that the point of reference is still us 10 years ago. And I remember when the Supreme Anti-Corruption Court and NABU 
when they were created, there were different discussions around it, and people expressed different opinions, representatives of different agencies or, and organizations, and we see the result. Probably it, it's not quite as we expected, but probably it's um, not a matter of institutions alone, but also of our expectations. Maybe they are a little bit too high. Comparing to what we expect from the result of this of that activity, it's a complex story. Countering corruption is not about uh, inevitability of justice. It's about culture. It's about personalities, specific people. It's about standards, values, principles in very specific society, very specific social. It's a very complex story, so developing some easy solution without complex discussion, you know, it's very difficult. So every discussion should result in some solution. Of course, everyone is disappointed if discussion just ends in nothing. But in Ukraine, we see the results of build, such as building of this anti-corruption infrastructure. We see such results as prevention and we see changes. In what Sergei Yatsik was saying, even on part of the students, school students, the way they do view it, they construe it, there are very practical evidences. I think that such institutions as Kiev Mohila Academy, without creating those islands of respectability, they would not have been able to compete. And now they are very well-known institutions that for a large fraction of school children in Ukraine, school students in Ukraine, are the desired institutions where they want to enter. And I think no one could say that in those universities we have some, some loud corruption stories or corruption is a standard there. No, they are reputed environments. But again, that was a result of some discussion whether those universities need to exist even. Thank you. And I cannot help but add that even our today's discussion is not like we've just got together to, to talk, but it's a result of some preparations by Vox Ukraine with the support of EU, thanks to which we can now gather and discuss our experience. Basically, on top of the prepared studies, we've also developed and we've, we've held the tournaments on Crystal Lighthouse table game. We had meetings and sessions with the stakeholders, representatives of local civil organizations, local governments, local journalists, representatives of the communities. My co co colleague, colleague Victoria Agapova will tell you more detail about it during a second panel, what we've seen there. So today's discussion is about the real result. As to the activities, to the measures, as to the expectations, like Mr. Taras has said, based on my limited experience, sometimes the everyday discussions, they end in proposition of reinstatement of death penalty when we talk about corruption. But there are way more methods that we can use to prevent corruption, to overcome its consequences like work with the youth is one of such tools, one of such methods that we resort to. As Mr. Taras said in the very beginning, a very good phrase, zero tolerance of corruption should become a new gold standard for the generations to come. And we've got involved in formulating of this new common standard. And thus you've summarized the first panel for me. Thank you very much. I want to thank the par participants of this panel discussion. We're having a small break, eight minutes, and during the second half, we will talk about the ways we can cooperate with the youth to spread their respectable practices.
Макса, дай, будь ласка, презентацію на екран. Медіа-центр Україна Укринформи Вокс-Чек продовжують відкрите обговорення побороти корупцію в Україні. So let's proceed to our second panel discussion titled Cooperation with the Youth 
for spreading integrity practices. Joining us in our studio are Victoria Agapova, Vox Ukraine, Dmitro Sirotyuk, Methodologist, Ukrainian Leadership Academy, Anna Borodina, Child and Family Psychologist Certified Trainer, and Alena Hilko, Project Manager at the Integrity Office of the National Agency on Corruption Prevention. So, Miss Victoria, now we will be talking about the youth, about the children. So, during our previous panel, the speakers were saying, why do we consider this target audience, but corruption in children, they don't really tie together in my head. So how did you come up with this idea that talking about corruption, we should start talking about corruption with the kids from the young ages rather than with the adults who are perceiving corruption in Ukraine? Well, the answer may be quite obvious because everything starts with children from our youth, from our childhood, but if we proceed to the facts, Box Ukraine had a sociological survey in January 23. It was a representative survey of the youth aged 15 to 18, and we've identified that 53% of young Ukrainians think that corruption is an integral part of Ukrainian mentality. So it's a huge percentage of those surveyed. And then we've decided that we have to work with this and we have to start with the children because that's the period when the perception of corruption is being formulated, something that we have discussed during the previous panel, and their understanding and toleration of the corruption begins there. It begins with the educational institutions, with the environment, because they spend the majority of their lifetime there, the kindergarten schools. Well, let's talk about schools. And this is where they formulate those skills of social communication. This is where their toleration of corruption is formulated. You know, when they say, we've cheated on the exam, or I can help my friend, my classmate, that's one thing, but that's only the beginning. And this toleration that I will let someone copy my answers, or I will cheat in my homework, it results in everyday corruption. Like here, I cheat, here I pay the teacher, for a good mark, or like flowers on the 8th of March, or like something that I remember back from my childhood as I was studying in school, there was an idea that it's necessary to pay some gratitude, like you were studying well, you're, you were doing a great job, but to still confirm it, you have to express some gratitude for this, but not for like doing your homework well. So when we tolerate it, when we give presents, when we cheat on the exams, those children grow up and it's a standard for them to pay a medical employee for some, I don't know, a certificate or an excerpt, any paper that or allows you to attend, say, swimming pool without passing the tests, like you have no skin diseases, for example. So this is where we tolerate corruption on the everyday level. And if, for example, government officials can afford stealing, why cannot I? And this is when we understand that we have to start working with the children from the young age. We have to educate this integrity in them from the school years. We understand there are some restrictions, like you cannot formulate some, you cannot create some perfect space in the education space. Like here, we're adhering to the integrity values, and then a person comes to edu an educational institution and is facing corruption, or as they reach 15 years of age, they want to pass a driver's license exam, and then they would be facing that lack of integrity. So within the framework of our integrity marathon that we've implemented with the EU Anti-Corruption Initiative in Ukraine, and the representative of this organization, Mr. Taras Slushik, was joining us today, that we really appreciate. So we've implemented the project 
of Youth Marathon of Integrity. We had a number of different activities there that included the workshops for the teachers, for the students as to the youth of integrity-based behavior in schools, and we've developed a board game that I want to tell you about a little bit later. So let's proceed to the game right away, because many people have already seen this game today, so let's give more color about this game. So it's a board game that we've developed in cooperation with the, with the World of Communities, an organization that is developing games, and over there there are leaflets where you can QR where you can scan the QR code, you can print it out and play with your family during your pastime or hand it over to your to your to the adolescents you know. And in those game we wanted to demonstrate the ways of cooperation for the sake of achievement of common goals. It's built as a fantasy adventure like the evil forces destroyed a crystal lighthouse of integrity and they've hidden the parts, the broken parts of that lighthouse in different parts of the world and children are supposed to find them within the 10 rounds of the game and to find those pieces of lighthouse they have to solve the moral ethical dilemmas and this is where things become interesting because those moral dilemmas they demonstrate that Integrity-based behavior is not always encouraged, like sometimes you can act in a moral and ethical manner, but it, it's not like of harm to you, but it creates certain obstacles in getting this part of you or your part of the lighthouse. You have to pay a giant, for example, to To let you pass. So this is a game where we try to illustrate that the integrity-based behavior is awarded in the end. So we wanted to create the perfect world with unicorns and people have to understand that sometimes your integrity-based behavior may not always be awarded or encouraged. But what's interesting, children were solving those moral and ethical dilemmas Sometimes they were not quite satisfied with the results of their choice because they did something, but they've got a toxicity token for that or for the good behavior they were getting integrity badges or integrity tokens. Or sometimes they were arguing, why cannot we buy a present for the head of the island for just being a good guy? So why would we by a present for him if he just does his job. So those moral and ethical dilemmas were supposed to show them that the choice is not always always obvious. But thanks to building a strategy and children really did, did build a strategy like two or three rounds ahead. They were discussing who should go where, use magic cars to get artifacts to pass the rounds to each other for the sake of achievement of common goals and thanks to this strategy all in all they were finding the pieces of the lighthouse and they were realizing like yes really our choice in this or that moral and ethical dilemma it helped us to achieve our goal or otherwise it pushed us or push this target away from us. Well, quite an interesting tool. I would like to expand this discussion on the tools. So, Mr. Mitro, how can we talk to the children about these complex things? Probably cartoons and games is probably the best way. So, and it's probably how it's done. So, how we can generally adapt those tools? for discussion of integrity. What are those basic practices to make sure that this hor horrible word corruption is understandable for the children and they get these practices? 
Hello, hi, my name is Dmitro. I work with the Ukrainian Leadership Academy. Our students are the children who graduated from school and who intend to enter higher educational institutions. And before that, they undergo the academy program. So I would like to discuss two components. So if we talk about the kids, it's important to mention that children know the world through the game, to something that they can sense through all those all their sense glands and wonderful way of interaction is the game and it's cool to have elements of gamification in the process of development of, of a child so as we create this world so to say a legend where we immerse people get tested and thus they test their understanding of processes so talking about the adolescence there is another process going on there we focus on this in the academy the formation well it's a part of education that children get at at home and then the school provides with more opportunities as an element of replay so for formation is about this moment when we rethink everything that our parents taught us through our spirit of rebellion and based on our experience we understand whether it works for me or not or those are angst of, angst of my parents so during this period of formation the adolescents they test everything that they were taught before to formulate their own moral values or I, I, how can we describe it in other words any rules that they would comply with and during this period they may be facing the experience of college or institute where there are some uh, elements of corruption existing that may be a withdrawal from this integrity and there are two ways one is the way of injustice when someone studies well and they get the same mark as those who don't study well who violate the rules and another way for those who are looking for easy ways for those who don't want to study it's an opportunity to camouflage themselves as those who study well without real knowledge of the material that was being studied so it's just understand for our understanding of the view of integrity during the school years based on those two paradigms that's my reflection you know and this is when we get the value of assessment or evaluation formulated remember yourself getting good or bad marks i also volunteer in plus and we organize the camps with the scaling there is rating who express themselves better in during the summer camp and it's an honorable rank and those who don't get enough knowledge like you know they are not be graduating from the summer camp so they have to attend the summer camp once again like in the academy we don't have any such evaluation system we talk more about quality rather than quantity and since it's a process of formation it's more about moral elements which can hardly be tested in some tests or evaluated during the test because in moral approaches there are causes and effects so in the university curriculum we cannot withdraw from the evaluation because we cannot test every single student in a quality manner so i'm having a question to my marks when i was getting a bad mark i was thinking like i am bad because i didn't manage to study something but it's a not evaluation of a person itself but it's evaluation of their knowledge we have to understand it and we have to explain it to the children to the school children we're talking about the evaluation of your knowledge not of yourself of your persona and when we talk about persona it it's trans transformed it to some social rating or something but when we evaluate the knowledge it's about the real realization of the fact that something else has to be studied some more tasks have to be solved to continue the education if you haven't mastered one element of the curriculum you cannot proceed to the more complex one and it's logical i think that everybody has this realization in the majority of cases it just does not exist and 
people as they come to the summer camp as they get bad marks like they treat it in a different way like i'm bad or i was evaluated in the wrong way so and it results in hate towards the instructors and it's uh, rather than changing the individual plan of development so to say to master more knowledge and to get a good mark so it's a testing not of me but of the teacher so is it okay to create well to, to create this object of education as a student and it's important to give this student a subjectivity to let them know that they're responsible for their marks for the knowledge that they master but the teacher is uh, picking the tasks but there should be still a dialogue in gamification in the game the result is either win or lose but if it's a game it's a collective game of collective interaction where you can only win joining your efforts every single participant is interested in tipping a, a player what to do so they win together and i think it's a quality process for formulating of algorithms for decision making solutions in certain situations and compliance with the common rules so that everybody wins rather than everybody loses this is my experience thank you very much well national agency for corruption prevention does the same but with the adults and this is where we would like to hear a word from a representative of this agency so how can such an important anti-corruption agency engage school children so that we can build the common responsibility and liability for corruption well you know i'm surprised that you've asked this because as people hear that i represent the integrity integrity department or integrity office of the national agency on corruption prevention you people keep asking me what do you have to do with the kids like because you are the ones who deal with corruption those terrible things and now there is education and yes i represent the integrity office of the national agency on corruption prevention and i'm a manager of the old ukrainian project transparent school and we have quite an ambitious goal we launched the education initiatives to expand on the topic of integrity we don't only work with the school children the office of integrity has two areas of work in their portfolio one is transparent school and another is transparent universities so basically we work with the school children from first to 11th grade and my colleague works on transparent universities both with the students and teachers and professors and deans of those uh, educational institutions it's difficult to talk about integrity but we do it successfully and it yields results integrity is quite an abstract notion like corruption is a terrible word and integrity may be not so easy to understand because what do you invest in this notion so we keep asking our children our professors what do they invest in this notion i have an, a, two years of experience of work on integrity with the in education field and it's a pleasure for me to observe the way that children explain the notion of integrity like this year vox ukraine our partners had an opportunity to watch children explain this so this year they were saying it's about responsibility it's about compliance with the rules it's about compliance with the laws last year they were mostly asking like why are you asking like integrity in ukrainian it has two roots kind and honest like yes due to the circumstances that our country ended up in they have to get this experience you know where they have to understand 
certain laws, for example, why you cannot take pictures of military material or check posts and you cannot disseminate those pictures. So you cannot first, it's in violation of the law and then we're talking about consequences, right? So it, for me, it's very pleasant to see that children sort out the notion of integrity and now they can explain it in a more profound manner. We offered them to use such notion provided by our partners, like act right even when nobody sees you. Because when we're honest with ourselves, we are honest with the others and we have to do it not only in front of the audience or when we want to be liked by somebody because we have this office, we have this position where we have to demonstrate how honest and how good we are. No, we have to act like this always. So what do we offer for our teachers? As they come to the kids and they talk to them about integrity, once again, they are being asked, what about this value? What about this notion? And this is where we offer them to break down this virtue in a number of other virtues like responsibility, honesty, justice, mutual respect and ability to discuss. Because exiting discussion in a proper way is a skill, you know, to honor someone else's opinion, to finish the discussion on a good note. And the best thing that the teachers and the students like is the respect to the rules and compliance with the rules. It's, it's easy. We have rules, we comply with them. We talk about common rules that we use in the society, like yielding your seat in the public transport, saying hello, like saying thank you, something that is not written anywhere, but something that is being taught from the very early childhood. There are rules in the classroom, there are rules in the school, the rules in a company. When a physical training teacher t tells about the rules during the in the classroom, the, it's like teacher tells children what they are not supposed to do or like teacher discloses the consequences right away or why cannot you cross the school when there is red, li red light on like because children are being taught in school like those are the consequences those are threat to your life but there are cases when a child is pulling their kid like with the red light on and they say like nobody's seeing you there are no cars we can go but the ch child resists and they say like no i've been taught in school that you cannot do so so those are the elementary rules that we comply with and we do the right thing it's not difficult right if we dig really deep into detail, my colleagues told me why do we work with the youth, with the school children, why do we work with the education, with all the participants of the education process, because really the children, the youth, they are just starting their path or they're just stepping on their path in this society and we have to make sure that their experience includes more integrity-based behavior, integrity-based practice and to minimize those non-integrity-based things in their life. People or children, they spend more, most of their time in school and on top of that, they follow the behavior of the adults and come into school, they still have that teacher who is an example for them, who is the one they want to see in front of them all the time, somebody whom they love, whom they value, and for them, they are ready to come to school in a good mood because that's a person whose values they share. And integrity is one of those values. And a teacher demonstrating on their own example, they show that you can act right, like not run around during the breaks in school, because it's not only like physical entertainment. Yes, you can do it, but let's talk about the consequences. You can hurt somebody, and in the same way, teacher finds other activities that still fit for the children. They will there will be some activity, but children don't get injured. So how do we do it? Within the framework of our project Transparent School, 
we do formal and informal trainings for the teachers and to the teachers or sorry to the students of all of the schools all across Ukraine so what are we offering our target audience are the students the teachers school directors we have trained and content for all of the representatives of our target audience we had a pilot project that was called education navigator a guidelines for school directors how to transform uh, an educational institution based on the values of transparency and openness so based on those recommendations we have trainings in a number of regions of ukraine last year we started this work because you understand as we provide some tools to the teachers they will convey them to the children and in the school in every area they will be happening something that is going on in some educational institutions if there is no access to information no transparency nothing it will take us a lot longer to provide some good shifts some good to yield some good results so those are the developments that we have for transformation of educational institutions all across ukraine and of course teachers because through them we come to the students we cannot cover all the students by our integrity office alone i mean in our government controlled and private educational institutions but we have aids in ukraine there are 15 integrity hubs opened all across ukraine the ambassadors of integrity the islands of integrity in the regions that help us popularize our educational content to work with the schools because currently our project covers 450 schools all around ukraine that work with us for the second year we're only growing we're expanding and it's great for the teachers we offer the training courses on, on our online platform where they not only can get experience and skills but they can improve their qualification and we have a lot of training materials as well so what are we offering for the grade 9 we've developed an anti-corruption course that is made of 15 lessons it's not a boring theory it's not like reading articles of the legislation it's interactive those are games videos different applications using which a nine grader get deeper and deeper in these topics sorting sorting them out with every single lesson better and better so as we were launching the pilot project when we were piloting those materials in the nine grades we were mm, testing them in the beginning and in the end and the survey was aimed at the results of change of be in behavior change in the knowledge and attitude to such phenomena as corruption i would not say that we've got some wonderful results within half a year within a pilot but there were changes but because many students did not even know what corruption is and that on top of this negative phenomena there are other non-integrity based approaches then there are notes about integrity those are extracurricular our school life like was boiling down to say a teacher reading the marks or like something that that's like short briefing that was happening before the vacations or recess like for example integrity online like our schools but the solution that was mentioned today in our school we have our children learn the information about the fakes and for us as soon as those news on solution has popped up the school started asking us where is this link to integrity of line online because everybody comes to us asking like have you seen it have you heard it and we understand that it was fake so we want to remind everybody it's fake also we develop manuals for our schools for the integrity week integrity week is taking place in schools 
to commemorate the 9th of December, the Global Day of Contract Corruption. So, in those guidelines, there are lessons for all categories of all ages, so to say. And our most recent news are the materials that can be found without additional time that you have to spend to find it. Because we understand there is curriculum and teachers not always can use our materials because there are basic subjects taught, basic disciplines taught at school. So one week ago we presented topics and exercises in all subjects that that draw this line of integrity all across the disciplines. It can be a chemistry lesson in integrity, Ukrainian language lesson in integrity, physics integrity. And like you in fifth grade you re recall integrity during the Ukrainian language lesson, then in the sixth grade it happens during the chemistry lesson. So on a subconscious level it influences way better than us holding a lesson ourselves. Well, thank you very much. I think that this is where we have to ask a child therapist how to talk to children about integrity and corruption so we don't scare them away. Thank you very much. Yes, scaring uh, is an important element because even the adults get scared of the notion corruption. So I want to thank the previous speakers for their input they've provided and I would like to use a case about the traffic light. Like my internal psychologist was not able to ask this question that most likely the child who was out from basic school because an adolescent would not say so. It is important to realize that we talk to different ages of children to different in different ways because since the birth all the way to seven years the children are being or are like they just start studying in school so up to seven years the main activity with the children is the game so we may not even use such words as identity or corruption or just tell them that those are values they influence our well-being your feeling of well like you, you, when you feel well, we feel well. When we feel well, you feel well too. And as the children come to school, there were mentions of social that children try to build themselves into the social. So let me call use this case when a child says, like a teacher said. So after seven years, the role model is switched to the teachers. And when the teachers say, like, Okay, as you write, you may write behind the margins, but no, in school you cannot write behind the margins. And talking about the adolescents, Mr. Dmitro has put it very correctly. It's my favorite, my favorite phrase that the age, adolescent age, is the age of depreciation of values. When children depreciate all of the values that they've taught at home, that they've learned at home and they, they go to the world to learn for new values and it's good that the adults in that world they share the same values which influence your resilience for the run and those are the clear things using which we can tell them about integrity because this truth some, sometimes is real scary I worked in school four years ago and this is when they, uh, they started started talking about academic integrity and even when I was talking about the school teachers, the, they, I asked them, have you heard about integrity? They said like, oh, I have to look through it because it's important to have this thing uh, here in, in school. So I want to th say thank you to all of the speakers. It was true that was, it was said during the first panel that children are our future, but us as adults, we need to help them grow in a proper manner. We have a special guest that we were not telling you about, a person who, whose name is Lyubila Tobolina, the teacher of Ukrainian language and literature, who can tell us about the way she works with integrity in schools. Well, I'm pre keep preparing to the lessons and I keep listening to you with one where so talking about cooperation with the integrity office and directly with Miss Alona 
I take pride in this cooperation because even during analysis of our works we worked with the children on the topic of integrity and this year I'm on top of language and literature you know about soft skills so I teach soft skills for the children in 10 and 11 grade in grade 10 and 11 and today I had such a course if I've come for the first lesson with my topic because those uh, new children to me then I'm saying like children guys maybe it's better if you suggest something for me for the, for the following lesson something some topic that will be of interest to you the speakers were saying what content is interesting for the children it went it was surprising to me to hear from them three topics prominent personality stereotypes and corruption I was like real surprised and we really started with it like last week and today we worked with them on the topic of corruption by the way I'm having the materials that we worked with on me and we, we worked with the situations in the area of state development like real situations that children will be facing in their adult life 100 percent and i sometimes sometimes tell them that it's cool if you met open and honest people in your way but unfortunately it's less likely to happen because that's a perfect picture and my task as a teacher is to train you to prepare you to those challenges to those situations you will be facing so you act in an honest way as miss alona puts it even when nobody sees you that's a very cool notion so thank you very much for the game we're definitely gonna play it and we'll spread it thank you very much for sharing your experience Dear journalists, you are welcome to ask your questions from the speakers in case you have any. I would like to ask Miss Alona. I'm really fond of this idea that you came to the school with the values. Unfortunately, for a long time, the school was getting rid of the values but rather was translating certain knowledge and it was the main task of the education field and i wish you in cooperation with the cultural organizations to come to the ministry of education to bring order over there because for us values are of our the values are principled to us as Alexander Peskover was saying that our value is survival survive whatever it takes and we have to get away from this value well that was more of a comment rather than a question maybe someone else has any questions well there are no more questions on the floor and I want to thank our speakers well I was saddened a little bit because I realized that I was a corruptioner in school I was letting my classmates cheat having my answers copied but let me remind you that Ukrainian Media Center Ukraine Forum just had a, a discussion entitled Overcoming Corruption in Ukraine and Ukraine Media Center will continue its operation tomorrow. Stay tuned for announcements.